Welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining us for today's GLR, GLR Week webinar, The Promise and Potential of Play-Based Learning. I can't tell you how personally excited I am for this session. It's going to be awesome. We are really excited because we are continuing, continuing our excellent series of GLR Week 2024, um, and we're picking up on the session we just had earlier today, where we celebrated the role of children's museums in their multiple and unique contributions to child development, literacy and learning, and early school success. And if you joined us for that session, you heard that a big part of that contribution comes from the hands-on play and games children get to engage in while at the Fun Museum. And now for this session, for this afternoon session, we get to dive deep into play-based learning as a teaching and learning strategy that's also used in the classroom as a research-based approach that has demonstrated, been demonstrated to accelerate kindergarten and early school success. In fact, the Early Learning Academies has found that play-based learning helps learners to be interested in what they are learning, more likely to retain knowledge and to apply new knowledge to different activities. And by allowing children to engage with letters, sounds, words, and books through play, it increases their ability to form language and strengthens their early literacy skills. And now with the onset of artificial intelligence and the growing field of gaming and ed tech, there are even more resources to support this playful and engaging approach in the classroom and out of, outside of school. So in our session right now, we are so lucky to have several of the top experts and researchers who are finding even more evidence of the ways in which play-based learning can impact the progress of young students from the most marginalized demographic groups. We also have an expert who can tell us more about how gaming and technology are enabling unique play-based learning experiences, along with a leader from a state department of education that is committed to this strategy statewide, along with a recently retired kindergarten teacher who has successfully used this strategy for many years in her classroom and has seen the impacts it has had on her students as they transition to first grade and into elementary school. And just to highlight, as a special treat, a few of our experts will be staying on the Zoom for 15 to 20 minutes after the webinar wraps to respond to your direct questions. And of course, we also will have time during the webinar for Q&A, but if you'd like to stay on for kind of more of an intimate back and forth with a few of our speakers, you're invited to do that. Um, and now I'm honored to welcome and briefly introduce our esteemed moderator and our panelists with us today. And please note that full bios have already been linked in the chat. And I'll, get, I'll put it back in the chat too. So I'm just quickly previewing who we have with us today. So we are very lucky to have an expert leader in learning and development joining us today to moderate our insightful discussion. Dr. William R. Height is the president and CEO of KnowledgeWorks. And prior to joining KnowledgeWorks, Dr. Height served as superintendent of the School District of Philadelphia, the largest public school system in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Under his leadership, the district expanded innovative school models, redesigning schools in partnership with communities. And our discussants today include Kathy Baer, who taught kindergarten for 36 years in Pennsylvania. Kathy believes in kindergarten, believes kindergarten is the foundation of all learning and that play is a child's occupation just as teaching is her occupation. And she helped bring full day play-based kindergarten to her district, a model that other districts are emulating. Andres Bustamante is an associate professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Education. He designs and implements play-based early childhood STEM interventions in places and spaces that children and families spend time, such as parks, schoolyards, grocery stores, et cetera. And he designs these spaces um, in partnership with local uh, children and families. Kate Dole is an education specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. Kate provides technical assistance and professional development on due process and implementation of best practices in early childhood special education. She also collaborates closely with her colleagues in general education to bring an ECSE perspective to work related to ongoing assessments, successful transitions from ECSE to kindergarten, multilingual learners, early literacy and play-based learning. Kathy Hirsch-Pasek is a professor of psychology at Temple University and a senior, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and was declared a scientific entrepreneur from the American Association of Psychology. Writing 17 books and 250 plus publications, her initiative Playful Learning Landscapes reimagines cities and public squares as places with science-infused designs that, that enhance academic and social opportunities. 
Abby Jenkins is Senior Director of Content with PBS Kids, where she leads innovative content development and cross-platform strategies. Abby oversees content for the Webby award-winning pbskids.org and PBS Kids Games app, including hundreds of educational games, apps, and interactive experiences for children from series like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Wild Kratz, and more. And Ryan Lee, Dr. Ryan Lee James is a speech language pathologist and researcher with expertise in language development, language disorders, and reading disabilities with emphasis on African-American English and other non-mainstream dialects with a focus on equity in higher education and improving service delivery for students of the global majority. She spent three years as an assistant professor cultivating a research program, teaching, mentoring, and innovating, and innovating coursework. So I know you agree with me that we have, as we were just saying, you know, the Olympics are coming. We have the gold medal panel today. So I say welcome to all of you. I cannot wait to learn from you. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Bill to get our conversation going. Thanks so much, Emily. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm equally excited about the conversations that we're going to have and particularly the experts who are with us today. Now, just imagine a learning context in which learners engage with content through various forms of play. It's not a novel idea. It's an idea actually supported in research. And many individuals, particularly those individuals that we have the privilege at my organization of working with, think that it's hard and difficult to do. And I think you're gonna hear from a lot of experts today around how they can implement it without going outside of the curriculum or doing different things, but it is really focused on being more responsive to the learner. And it's also designed to identify and, and identify for many of us, the gaps that were amplified by the pandemic, but we all know that they already existed and we've known that for years. And so we need to understand more about what states and districts are doing to address the issues of inequity that unfortunately have been in their systems for years um, and, and persist. And it also persists specifically in the early grades. And so that's why we have to think of play as a critical learning opportunities for our young people. And just imagine having opportunities for young people that, that are fun, that they engage in where learning occurs without them even thinking about it or knowing that it's occurring, but they're enjoying it nonetheless. So I would like to begin with our national research experts, Ryan, Andres, and Kathy, to further set the context and help us understand the gaps in the early grades and what research has shown about how play-based learning can fill those gaps. So Kathy, so we'll start with you, particularly since both of us spend a good bit of our time in Philadelphia. Many consider you the godmother of play-based learning. So let's begin with you. How do you create environments that can make sure there is access to these learning opportunities that will allow every child to thrive? Well, thank you, Bill, for asking. Um, we just took a look around the country at what's going on in classrooms. And I think all of us, we're working so hard as teachers. And if we only weren't handcuffed, I think all of us would kind of know what to do. But what has happened is because we've been handcuffed, we're teaching a lot at people, not with people. Most of our classrooms in the country today, in fact, by our measures, 50%, um, look like the kids are sitting around together in rows doing worksheets. Just think of that, 50% of our time. Then we have another 25% of our time when we're moving around from place to place to place to place. So how are we supposed to somehow harness all of this and get kids interested in school today? And should we be surprised when the first thing that comes out of their mouth is it's boring? So in a very novel idea, not so novel, but I'll just take a second to say it and then I'll throw it out to the rest of you. Um, we thought it might be a cool idea to teach in the way that human brains learn. And human brains aren't just sitting there passively waiting for stuff to be dumped in. Brains are active. They're engaging. They like stuff that's meaningful. 
And when you bring in things from the culture and the community that are funds of knowledge, it becomes meaningful. You can do anything in that. We like things that are socially interactive. I mean, imagine if you want people to learn to have more conversations, let them talk with each other, let them work together. And here's the biggie. Let's see if we could have more joy in that classroom for the teachers and for the students. And if you can do that, and we posit that you can, and you can do it no matter what the subject matter, you have active playful learning. Kathy, I so appreciate that. And the and you made me think of several things as you were working, as you were responding. And you know, I've I've heard you directly, I mean, share that you don't like to use the terms gaps and or loss. Um, but how are you thinking about addressing gaps in early learning? I mean, and especially for marginalized groups who historically have not had access to the assets to achieve. And I'm, I'm, and we're both in Philadelphia. And so we know um, that the, the vast majority of children who are in the school district of Philadelphia didn't have act or don't have access to these types of assets. But nonetheless, then how then would you approach or what would you recommend in terms of addressing gaps in early learning, especially for those mm -hmm. marginalized groups? Sure. Well, um, the reason that I, I don't love the term gap so much and I don't love the term learning loss is because I think it puts people in bins. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways, what we've done is we've shoved people in a bin and when they're in that bin, they're not sure they can get out of that bin. They give me all the reasons why I can't get out. And last I looked, human brains are all built pretty much the same way. Evolution has endowed us with amazingment. And believe me, even in what you might call the lowest resource environments, there are many things to look at, play with. And I don't mean play with, haha. -ha. I mean to explore, to learn from. I like to think of it, when I when I hear the term learning loss, it worries me and I'm going to tell you why and then what I do about it. It bothers me because when I look at the NAEP scores, the NAEP scores, prior to COVID, I was seeing about 30%, 28%, 29% that had received, that were at basic level proficiency. Now, I don't know about you. But when I see 28, 29% of kids across the country, no matter where, are reaching basic level proficiency, I am not impressed. I don't know where the other end of the gap is. So our view is find a way to teach that is inclusive, that is enjoyable, that gives multiple access to anyone who wants to learn, that is respectful of the culture and the community that the kids and the families, and I mean the families too, because the families are part of what goes on in an educational system. How do we bring them all in? And one way to bring them all in is to understand that education is not one size fits all. Usually the one size fits no one. And maybe what we need to do is to find an engaging, playful environment. And again, I'm not talking about just going to the jungle gym, but though, by the way, you can learn physics there. I am saying that if we find things that are more enjoyable, where kids are active discoverers, I think we'll find that all children will rise. And to me, that's the goal. I think we want to have a trajectory, not bins. And that's why I don't like the terminology. So appreciate that. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll, we may come back to that if we have time. And, and, but we also have other individuals that we want to hear from, at least in this first section. And so, Ryan, please share your perspective on the disproportionality in access and what we know about the benefits of play and what it will take to ensure this learning strategy is available to all groups that have um, in some case, in many cases, been disenfranchised. Yeah, thank you um, for that question, Bill. And I'm really delighted to be here and just be on this panel and hear from my colleagues sharing this timely information. Um, I think, uh, you know, similar, I have very similar thoughts to Kathy on this topic, especially when we think about 
<clears throat> using deficit-based terminology, we know factually that since the NAEP, um, many, many years ago, um, before I was in education even, um, we saw this pattern of lack of access. <clears throat> and of course, that access or lack of disproportionately impacts certain groups. We often talk about children who are learning English as a second or third language. We often talk about children who identify as Black, children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. And so, <clears throat> Kathy said it perfectly that it is true that this pattern has been going on right forever and ever. And so I think it's really important for us to think about those systems level barriers because Kathy also opened by saying that teachers are handcuffed. And so a lot of what teachers and practitioners are gonna hear on today's call the systems leaders have to be clued in to say, how can we move the barriers out of their way so that they're able to do those things? <clears throat> But like all public health crises, we are the education included, we know disproportionately impacts certain groups. Um, <clears throat> as a speech language pathologist, I'm also very interested in children who are um, have developmental language disorder, autism, or any neurobiological difference. And so I think even when we look at the, the NAEP data, the National Assessment of Education Progress, specifically looking at literacy, as Kathy said, we see by fourth grade now roughly 35% of kids achieving basic proficiency. Surprisingly or not surprisingly, that doesn't improve by eighth and 12th grade, demonstrating that if you don't have those skills by the time you reach third or fourth grade, you're unlikely to get those skills. And that's a challenge because then you become an adult without the skills that you need to be able to access your fullest potential. <clears throat> Something else here that I think we have to call out on this topic of play-based learning is that children, there's also disproportional, disproportionality in access to special education, specifically in the area of speech language impairment and specific learning disability. And I know that over the years, there's been a lot of research that has been done to talk about how certain groups are overrepresented on special education. And I'm delighted to, to say that we have more current information now um, out of um, a, a school in Pennsylvania University, I can't remember, but I know for sure um, a professor out of UCI who has done some of this research to help us understand that in fact, People, children of color, children who are multilingual and children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds are not getting access to certain categories of special education in the way that they need to. And that's important. Why is that important? Because as a speech language pathologist and with pre-K kindergarten, we are employing play-based strategies um, in an effort to build language, build executive function skills and so forth. And so I think the issue of disproportionality is one that plagues us um, in our nation. I hope that we can start to think about something that Kathy said, what we're currently doing is really not working for anyone. The children who we have in our schools are multilingual are being reared in economic disadvantage and are by and large children of color. And so how can we start to shift from othering those groups and talking about disproportionality, which I know has been going on forever and ever, and start talking about strategies, culturally relevant strategies that, <clears throat> that can be used to teach all kids. Thanks, Ryan. And you, I mean, you, so you just reminded me of just like the, the the inequities that existed with respect, at least when I was in Philadelphia, with respect to, I mean, who had opportunities for this type of um, for this type of experience or learning experience, and so where many of our young people who who needed it most had limited access to those types of things, or uh, in, uh, in or were control more because we were trying to force more time for math, more time for reading instruction. Um, and then it took things away like opportunities to actually have a play-based learning experience. And so 
um, while the play-based learning experience actually could have enhanced like their ability to read and do math, right? So it's just, you just reminded me of that as you were uh, describing or responding to the initial question. But I'll ask Ryan, could you tell us more about what research <laughs> of, uh, about how and why play works and yet why it might be complicated for teachers to buy in to play as a learning strategy when they're focused and perhaps pressured um, to stay focused on things like science of reading? Yes. So this is a great question. And to your point about hyper-regulating certain environments and certain groups of kids, and I hope y'all can hear me okay. I'm having allergy issues consistently. So sorry about that. Um, but I think this, to the point about hyper-regulating certain groups of kids, though not for today's conversation, is one that we all really have to sit with as we head into next school year, because it is true that we are more comfortable regulating certain groups of kids, certain people. And I think we have to look um, from a cultural humility standpoint and ask ourselves, even as educators, why is that? Why do we believe um, that certain group of certain groups of kids should be in more hyper regulated situations where others can be free to explore this sort of joy and play and autonomy and really be in more child led situations and I think maybe y'all might be familiar with um, this NPR. Um, interview with a professor named Del Del Farron and researcher who had this uh, aha that rich children and poor children don't actually need different types of preschool experiences. And I got to tell you, when I read that in 2022, I was floored because I was thinking, wait a minute, in 2022, are people still thinking that? Oh my gosh, we have a long way to go. And not that the research hasn't told us different, we've got to make sure it gets into the hands of people that are serving children, because I think we've all known for a long time that that, that hasn't been true. Um, but to your point about all of the pressures that the teachers are under, we're in, um, I'm in Georgia, I work at the Atlanta Speech School. Um, in Atlanta, Georgia, I think was one of the 34th state to pass early literacy legislation. And a lot of the legislation that's being passed around the around the country is really focused on, maybe I've heard the terminology, the science of reading. And the science of reading, unfortunately, has taken on this connotation to really mean phonics. And people think about the science of reading and they think phonics. So in pre-K, I've got to do phonemic awareness drills and, and as Kathy said, worksheets. And then I've got to do my phonics, you know, um, scope and sequence. And while those things, can and do support when used effectively reading um, and later and reading and writing and spelling. It is also true that there's this whole other conversation in the science of reading world around oral language and executive functioning. And so I'm not going to talk about how because other colleagues here are going to give you more details on how this actually unfolds in the classroom. But I will say that what we know from research is that play-based strategies build oral language, listening and speaking, support executive functioning, support social communication um, uh, across different content areas and for different groups of children, whether, the, whether a child has a language impairment or being reared in economic disadvantage. And so really wanting to break down that um, I maybe widely held belief that we're talking about kids who need different things. And differentiation is we need. But it is also true that play-based approaches to teaching and learning um, really support <clears throat> all students. Oh, and I just Thanks, have Ryan. one more thing oh. to add here. I'm sorry. Sure, I'm very sure. sorry because I'm reading from my notes and I just want to make sure I say this, that again, the challenges that that I think we are up against are systems level challenges. And I work with teachers every day in my building and outside of my building. And what I know from working with teachers 
like parents, no one wants better for their students than teachers. And so if we can just move those barriers, those of us who have the ability and power to move those barriers out of the way for teachers, I think, I think we'll be well off. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad, Ryan, you added that. <laughs> Glad you glad you um, you added that point, Kathy. You wanted to um, add something to Ryan's comments. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in, Ryan, to say, "Oh, thank you, thank you." I'm sending you a, the biggest hug. Um, I actually one of those people who does the science of learning, and if there's one thing we actually know a lot about, it's the science of learning, and we do know that phonics is important. But let's ask for a second why it's important. <laughs> It's important because it means you can translate the alphabet, right, or squiggles on a page into sound. If you don't have all the rich language skills in any language or in both languages or in three languages, then guess what? You, you will go nowhere. So without strong language and communication skills, there is no such thing as strong reading skills. And somewhere we lost that in translation. Reading is about having strong language, understanding, world knowledge, and knowing phonics. But it's not phonics without meaning. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you from all of us who have toiled on this for 30 years. Please may it not be misunderstood. Thanks, Kathy. So we'll, Andres, we'll we'll um, give you an opportunity. So can you please build on these ideas and share what your research has demonstrated um, about the power, of, the power of play and what kids are doing during play, and especially how play is accelerating learning for multiple language learners? Yeah, really happy to. And um, yeah, I just feel grateful to be able to go after uh, uh, Kathy and Ryan, because they, I just get to build on the amazing points that they made. And so something that really resonated with me that both of them mentioned is that I understand the focus on um, gaps because you want to identify kids and communities who need support and, and channel resources to kind of uplift their communities. But in, in many ways, um, the focus on gaps misses the mark because um, like Ryan was saying, really it's uh, more systemic access to opportunities as driving um, uh, some of these um, differences and really less about any individual kid or family. And so the focus on school readiness and, and gaps can be kind of um, putting our focus on the wrong area. And I think multilingual learners are a great uh, example of this because where I like to put my focus and where I think is powerful is on children and family strengths and assets. And so when I think about multilingual learners, I think about kids who have a really pronounced strength and an opportunity to build really critical skills. And so if you think about kids who are learning more than one language, that has implications for, for their life and, and being able to communicate with people across the world in their career opportunities, being uh, bilingual is a, is a huge asset. Um, there's so much research on um, the cognitive development of bilingual children and their executive function skills. So when we think about kids who are navigating rich language environments, they're having to sh switch and shift their attention between who's speaking to me in Spanish and who's speaking to me in English. And, you know, that all this is really highly engaging. And I'll say that maybe Ryan is maybe even the best person to speak to this, but also by dialectism also applies many of these same um, cognitive advantages that we see in bilingualism because you're doing this code switching and this translanguaging. Um, and then also with multilingual learners, uh, there's there's uh, deep cultural assets that come along with navigating multilingual spaces. And so um, if you look at um, Tara Yasso and, and her community cultural wealth framework, she talks about linguistic and navigational capital. So kids who help their families navigate institutions uh, in English when they're in English, Spanish, bilinguals. And so, so many assets and so many strengths to build on. And I think if we focus there, we're going to, we're going to um, be able to channel our, our energy to uh, building from kids strengths. And so um, the research is really clear on, on kids language development. If you want to promote a kid's uh, second language development, the best thing you can do for them is build a strong foundation in their home language. And so creating playful learning environments that invite kids 
uh, to engage in their home language and uh, their second language that they're acquiring uh, creates a rich dynamic learning environment for them. Um, and I have a few like images of the way that uh, Kathy and I are doing this. So I don't know if we want to share screen, but um, yeah, we would love for you to share. Yeah, those. just a few examples. So we so Kathy um, started an initiative called Playful Learning Landscapes, which the link went up earlier, um, where we are working with communities to design everyday spaces, parks, bus stops, grocery stores, laundry mats, anywhere where kids and families spend time for play and for learning. And we design them in partnership with communities so that they reflect cultural assets and values and everyday routines and practices. And so that first image was a, a bus stop that uh, uses the game Loteria, which is like a um, kind of like a version of bingo that's very popular in Latino communities um, where you spin a wheel and you get an icon. And the beautiful thing about this design is families, and this is happening in, in Santa Ana, California, families don't need instructions to know how to play Loteria. This is their game. And so we embed um, uh, language and literacy and math and science learning opportunities into the game. Um, the next one shows uh, signage in the grocery store so that when families are picking out their produce, their, their papaya, their mango, their avocado, uh, inherently there's these intergenerational passed down tips and tricks about how to find the best fruit and vegetables. And this uh, these interactions involve deep science learning. So families are making comparisons, they're using their senses, they're observing, they're planning ahead. And so this sign just invites families to engage with their kids in these conversations. And so you're promoting uh, interaction, caregiver-child interaction that we know leads to rich learning uh, through these everyday routines. Um, the next one come is, is a mural, I believe. So uh, families in Santa Ana where we're working said, you know, our community doesn't have a lot of green space and open space, but we have a lot of walls. And so how can we activate the wall space in a dense urban environment to promote play and learning? And so this is kind of like building off a where's Waldo, I spy kind of concept. So kids are using their observation skills and their language skills to identify where's the hidden parrot or the balloon or the tiny little ant. And, and the whole image is set in their community. And so you can see um, the mariachi band, the paleta stand, the soccer, the city bus. So any it's all meaningful to them. And you can see that um, through all these installations, we're engaging kids in, in bilingual playful learning so that they can be drawing on their whole um, linguistic repertoire, um, uh, Spanish, English, and, and the mix thereof. I mean, the really... Um, the kids who have the best outcome in the long term are the ones we call them ba balanced bilinguals. And so the ones who can build a strong uh, foundation in their home language and in their English skills, those are the ones that long term have the strongest language outcomes. And even in the early grades, when you see some bilingual children um, uh, ass being assessed with lower English scores, if you take into account their English and Spanish scores, they actually have stronger vocabularies or, or language skills than some of their monolingual peers. And so uh, sometimes it's really about us and how we're measuring their language skills and not only about um, the actual abilities themselves. So um, I think those are just a few examples uh, uh, just to share how we're um, trying to promote these playful learning experiences in ways that resonate with kids and families and really, really draw on their strengths. Andres, I really appreciate you sharing the slides. And the the other things that, I mean, so can you speak more to uh, the things that you've discovered in, in, in your research around this topic um, that uh, could be beneficial um, or would likely be beneficial, not just to families and children, but to, to educators as well? Yeah, we have some really exciting evidence um, about the effectiveness. So some of those images I showed were in community spaces where yeah. um, the kind of data that we collect is around um, the language environment, uh, caregiver child interactional uh, conversational turns, the kinds of vocabulary they're using. Are they talking about math? Are they talking about science? Are they using spatial terms? But we also have projects in the school setting. Um, and so actually, if we could share uh, one more time the screen and we'll go a couple of slides down, I'll show you a, a school-based program where we have um, really strong evidence. Uh, it's a basketball court. Uh, we'll go, there it is. So this one's called Fraction Ball. 
Um, and it, since we went to the school space here, we were able to um, do an experimental study and measure kids math learning. So we redesigned the basketball court so kids can take a shot. The three point line because it's worth one hole and kids can take a shot worth a quarter point, a half a point, three quarters of a point. The left side of the court is decimals and the right side is fractions. And there's a number line on the side of the court for them to keep track of their score. So this builds on research on embodiment, on uh, magnitude understanding of fractions and conceptual understanding of fractions. And so we actually did um, uh, a randomized, an experimental study, a randomized control tri trial of um, kids playing this game versus business as usual math class. And we find very strong impacts on kids fraction and decimal learning, which is a notoriously challenging math context um, to move the needle on. And so on average, a kid who was in the 50th percentile in their fraction learning would go all the way up to the 75th percentile after only a three week program a, a, a playing fraction ball. And so this is to me a really concrete example that you can bring play, physical, joyful, out outdoor activities to the school space uh, and, and you get you get amazing impacts and the kids love it and they're excited to go to school in the morning. I think the next the next slide is um, actually a whole number version that we did. So it's the same game, but whole numbers instead of fractions for younger kids. Um, and actually we switched it to soccer because it was easier for the little ones to kick the ball than to shoot through the hoop. But um, same thing, same idea. I mean, uh, when, when kids are, uh, are up, when they're physically active, when they're engaged, when they're hands on and minds on, um, the learning just, it's, it, it's more powerful. And so um, I, I think this stuff has a space in school, out of school and in the home and everywhere we go. Yeah, no, really appreciate that. And I just can't help but think uh, about the importance in these in developing these types of spaces, how important it is to also involve like the learners and or communities um, so that to your point, it, it speaks to their culture, it speaks to what they enjoy. Um, so really appreciate uh, some of the, um, some of the, the pictures that that you shared. I would also add here, and we're going to shift a, a little bit, we're going to shift the conversation um, to uh, the other panelists who will be speaking with us today. But as we shift, and we're going to be shifting to um, some of our state and local leaders. Um, and But before we shift, I would say that like my work as a school superintendent, and, and, the, and this was shared earlier, and about the systems and a lot of what needs to happen is at the systems level because teachers by and large have, they are so interested in how they can make learning more enjoyable. And they're trying to balance that with all of the structures and, and, and things that we have mandated uh, in schools. Um, and so I'm, I'm balancing it with that experience and my current experience as CEO of KnowledgeWorks where we're working with systems to actually create the conditions for personalizing competency-based learning. And play-based learning becomes a major part of that. And then coincidentally, um, we actually just released an article on how, um, what are the commonalities of personalized competency-based learning and play-based learning. And it really speaks to a lot of what Andreas and other panelists have shared. It, it's really about enjoyment, engagement, um, learning um, as a part of activities that young people uh, enjoy um, uh, being a part of. And so just wanted to add that. I'll put that article in the chat um, just so that individuals will have access to it. But to continue this robust discussion of the power and potential of play-based learning, I'm excited to now first bring in our play through gaming and technology expert from PBS Kids, Abby Jenkins. And then we will get to hear from Kate Dole, a state education leader, and Kathy Bear, an expert kindergarten teacher to learn more about how to build buy-in across the state and how to implement it into everyday learning in the classroom. And so Abby, we'll start with you. We're so glad to have you here with us to share more about how gaming AI and technology is being used in play-based learning and how these assets are engaging young learners and their families. 
Thank you so much, Bill. So good to be here with you all and uh, feel like I'm surrounded by giants um, in my day to day. My day to day literally is all about play. So I live and breathe this. Um, I'm on Zoom with kids as we're designing things with kids. And so, um, you know, that's really the perspective I can bring here is um, to talk about, you know, why games, uh, what goes into a game, and then what sort of like the next iteration as the media and technology is changing. Uh, so uh, for PBS Kids, why games? I mean, what we know is that when kids are spending time on a mobile or a tablet device, the number one thing they're doing is playing games. And those are just the facts. Um, that's part of how kids are experiencing media and that's part of how kids play. Um, that they are uh, native gamers. They are born gamers. They are born, this generation is born where they know they don't not know the tablet, for example. And so really um, take that seriously in terms of how kids are spending their time and thinking about how to make the most of that time and that kind of play experience for kids. Um, so we really just see games um, as an opportunity and exciting way for kids and their families um, around learning. And then for PBS, it uh, has been a part of our content model for over 25 years. So you may know PBS Kids shows, but as we're developing shows and characters, we are in, in parallel creating games because we know that's how kids experience um, that world is that they're watching and playing. And honestly, that's really the magic combination. If you've got a core idea or skill and you've got a relatable story, you want kids that, that combination of watching and playing where you carry those characters and stories across platforms, we think, um, is hugely impactful. Um, so as we're thinking about game design, we're really thinking about kids um, between the ages of three and eight years old um, and uh, really building on these multi-platform series, uh, resources, the community-based programs around them, um, but for kids to be able to really see themselves reflected um, through the characters um, and through positive role models um, in these games experiences. Uh, what goes into it? Uh, we have a very rigorous uh, researched way of developing content um, that is around the whole, a whole child approach um, for helping kids get ready for school. Um, so we really start with what uh, kids need. Um, we work with educational advisors and subject matter experts like the folks on this call today. We worked with many of you all um to uh, develop this content um and then our library of content which is over 250 games um is you know covers stem it covers literacy executive function computational thinking so we're really thinking about gaming in so many contexts here um, we also test our content with kids as uh, we're developing it i spent my team spends a lot of time um, from concept to finish, uh, working with kids and working with their advisors on that process. Um, so really thinking about, um, there's so much that goes into it. Um, but ultimately our philosophy is that the more ways kids engage with the content, the more they will learn. So these are just a few examples here on screen that I wanted to talk about what some of the key features of these games are. And going back to what Kathy hirsch uh shared earlier today, you know, key features are really active, playful learning includes joy and is socially interactive. So these, you know, our goal here is spark joy, playful, and we've got these relatable characters um, that are really about that core of the interactivity. Um, we're thinking about play patterns where kids are, you know, how kids are playing in their everyday lives. So you can see an example of Froyo stand here. Um, the context is kids are building a, a Froyo creation, a, a treat with certain criteria. And if you think about kids playing store, playing shop, you know, playing restaurant, we see kids do this all the time. So we know that. So thinking about how kids play in their daily lives and applying that in a game. The other win is that we heard from a parent recently who um, was on the playground with their young son who was uh, three or four years old and had set up a um, ice cream stand in, in the playground equipment. So it wasn't using the playground equipment, but it set up an ice cream stand and said, would you like a cup or a cone? Would you like a topping? And she's saying, well, how, how did you get this idea to um, set up your Froyo stand? And said, oh, well, that's because I played Donkey's Froyo stand. 
And so it kind of then circles back. And so we see that as such a big win. Um, so we love seeing that those connections and the application like, you know, ar around the whole child. Um, you know, the games are also a fun and safe way for for kids to um, to fail and to try things. Um, you can see um, an example in the top right of um, a game with a screenshot around a practicing a bedtime routine. So you can practice and rehearse, um, you know, skill areas around executive function, around practicing routines. In this particular game, there's, um, this is just one of five characters. Each character has their own uh, bedtime routine. So kids can really relate to that and practice these things in their daily lives um, in this uh, game environment. Um, so that's another approach we take. Um, some games are also designed with uh, other family members in mind. So you can see an example of a um, story creator activity where kids can uh, create their own stories. You can say making mud pies uh, where uh, you can invite a caregiver into that experience. So we're thinking about, you know, who's around that child and ways when you're creating and sharing something, um, those are can be opportunities to bring in others into the play experience. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of content, um, like Andra shared earlier, um, having multilingual content. So we've had a big emphasis on, we've been building our library around uh, Spanish language content. So offering games, um, both in English and in Spanish. And so we've been uh, ramping up those efforts as well. And then uh, lastly, when we are trying to think about getting games into the hands of kids, so the game distribution strategy and access to this content is huge. It drives a lot of our decisions about um, how to get this out there. Our local PBS stations are play a huge role in supporting this ecosystem, um, which include teachers and parents and other community members um, who also provide additional resources to engage families and kids anytime. So bringing this, trying to connect this content um, at the local level is a huge part of that. Um, so that we can have this content available in schools and libraries and at home. Um, we have the, the content is all free. It's on the free PBS Kids Games app and pbskids.org. Um, and we support older and lower power devices because kids have a lot of hand-me-down devices in their household. So we really need to account for that. We also need to account for kids not being um, necessarily on, on Wi-Fi or connected at all the time, or maybe having a spotty connection. So uh, we make sure that for if you have the games app, you can download that content for offline play. So once you've got that, you don't have to be connected, um, but you still have access to that content. Uh, so that's a big driver of the game distribution strategy. Um, and another consideration is thinking about um, a suite of accessibility features and settings within the game context so that kids can uh, customize it, personalize it to their learning needs and styles. So you'll find things like closed captioning option in games. You'll have different audio settings in games. So maybe you don't, maybe that background music is distracting to you, or maybe it's focusing for you, but you've got the option there to really tailor that experience to, to your own needs. So accessibility features is another um, key. If we go to the next slide, um, just want to speak a little bit about sort of what's ahead for us and then what we've been hearing, but you'll hear a lot about just in media in general, which is around AI. And um, we have a special project um, that we've been working with researchers um, at UC Irvine um, with, uh, with Andres, who's on the call today, who's a, a partner on this project, um, and also um, uh, researchers at University of Michigan. Um, around what we're calling conversational video. So uh, really what we're thinking about is AI and its potential for learning. Um, we really are thinking about new technology um, as, you know, you know, what is the opportunity here? Uh, as, you know, what are the right formats for this and the platforms, but it's here. So we're just thinking about what, how can we use this to best support young children and their learning? Um, we're also reflecting on, as we think about this project, um, you know, how kids have rich conversations um, as they're talking about and engaging with media. So if uh, kids and 
families are having conversations about the media that they're watching or they're playing together, we know that that can magnify learning gains. So if we think about that dialogue, you know, what could we do there? Um, so what we're looking at here on this screen um, are characters from two uh, PBS Kids series, Lila in the Loop um, on the left and Eleanor Wonders Why on the right. Uh, both of these are STEM shows. And um, in this uh, project, uh, we're using a, a talk based engine so that kids can uh, have a conversation with these characters. Uh, and um, so, we're, so it's a, it's a linear, it's following a storyline, but inserting moments within the story where the character can pause, turn to screen and maybe ask a prompt, a prompt or a question uh, to a to a to a child is part of that conversation. So really engaging kids as a thought partner um, as we are talking about science inquiry and computational thinking in these shows. Like how could we, um, you know, clean up all these marshmallows, you know, quickly, or what could we do here to make our, you know, car go faster? So it's really a way to prompt kids to be thinking more deeply. Um, it's not a quiz, um, but it's also an opportunity for kids to connect with characters in new ways. Uh, we're not thinking, we're not using any generative AI here. Um, our approach to the production is uh, working with series creators, working with educational advisors. So we are scripting um, the conversations and there's sort of a limited number of interactions that can happen. So really, um, you know, the people and the creators are part of this process. So nothing is getting, um, you know, generated here. Um, but we're excited about this potential for learning and Andres can speak speak to it if he wants to jump back on screen. But in the in the initial um, research findings around some of the Eleanor wonders why conversational video when compared to the non interactive version of that episode, we saw uh, learning and engagement go up um, significantly when we looked at when we evaluated those um, comparatively. So we think that there's um, a lot of potential here. Um, so we continue to be excited about this and um, there's more research on these um, uh, episodes ahead. Um, so we're excited to dig in more and learn more about this space. Abby, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing all of this information and the work that PBS Kids has done to create the access to all of these wonderful assets. And with that, I want to quickly shift to uh, Kate, and Kate, you hail from Minnesota, where the State Department of Education has made a public commitment to play-based learning with a focus on play in kindergarten. So can you tell us about this and how this decision to push this strategy was informed by research and what you are doing to build buy-in, especially given that school districts are locally controlled in Minnesota? How is your department helping districts understand the value of implementing uh, this approach? Yeah, thanks, Bill. So our work as a state agency really stemmed from our belief that school should be welcoming and joyful and that instruction should be developmentally appropriate and supported by research and play based learning really ticks both of those boxes. Um, however, as you uh, mentioned, Minnesota school districts are locally controlled, so they do get to determine which instructional methods are used to teach the statewide standards. But as a state agency that wants to promote best practices for young learners, we really needed to better understand why play was still disappearing from you know, preschool and kindergarten classrooms, despite all of the available research out there supporting its use. So one of the first things we did was collect data from kindergarten teachers through an annual survey. And if you pull up the slide that I shared, um, one of the questions we asked them was um, how supported they felt delivering developmentally appropriate play-based instruction. And we've asked this question for four years now. And it's interesting to note, there was kind of a little blip right after COVID where they were feeling a bit more supported, but if we look at our most recent data, um, still, you know, over half are feeling either just neutral or actively unsupported in providing um, play-based instruction in their classrooms. And when we asked the, um, the teachers who responded why they felt unsupported, the top responses 
overwhelmingly that their principal or other district administrators did not endorse play-based instruction and that the curriculum and assessments that are selected by their district didn't allow for the use of play. So knowing that we needed to create buy-in for play as a best practice for everyone from classroom teachers to principals to teaching and learning specialists to school superintendents, we've really been trying to be intentional about making some clear connections between play and the other things that we know are weighing heavily on the minds of educators right now. So first, we know that schools are reporting significant concerns with student behavior, student dysregulation, and we know that developmentally inappropriate methods of instruction for young learners, the, 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 the methods Kathy was referring to right at the outset that sitting in rows, doing worksheets, that's really contributing to that problem. The, the bodies and brains of young learners just weren't designed to sit in that type of whole group instruction for really lengthy periods of time. And we know that the research shows that joyful play-based learning helps young children stay engaged for longer and become more deeply engaged in learning. And we also know that play is foundational in the development of the executive functioning skills that Ryan was talking about earlier. Um, those skills are necessary for children to regulate their behavior, to problem solve, to take the perspective of others. You know, skills that are really important in the classroom, you know, and, and in life, truly. Um, and we also have been really intentional about pointing out that children who experience a sense of joy engagement and belonging at school are more likely to want to be at school. And we know that play is a best practice for facilitating that type of experience for children. And we think this is incredibly important to point out given the current concerns around chronic absenteeism that are existing in Minnesota and nationwide. Um, secondly, we've really observed a pervasive belief that at best, play is only useful for developing social emotional skills. And I think by the things that, you know, Andres demonstrated in his pictures, um, we have been really trying to promote that same idea that play-based learning, it, at play and learning are not mutually exclusive and that play can be used to provide instruction in all domains of learning. And we found it's really valuable to demonstrate that play can really manifest in many different ways. It's not just that classic image of a child playing in a in a toy kitchen while the teacher kind of sits back and observes with intention play can be set up to focus on all academic standards and the level of teacher involvement and direction will vary depending on activities or the individual needs of children in the class so just a few resources that we've created we have a one page illustrated guide called play in k we have created some webinars that highlight how play is aligned to the science of reading, which again, that came up earlier. It's another big initiative in Minnesota. And we really wanted to, to demonstrate that the science of reading and play don't, again, are not mutually exclusive. They can exist, they can coexist um, and play can really be used to promote that oral language that Kathy was talking about. Um, and we've also have been collaborating with uh, our colleagues in the math standards division to help demonstrate how play can be used in the context of math instruction. And really, I think our number one message to districts who are locally controlled is that they have the power to choose play as an instructional method for addressing our state standards. So it's almost like this idea of like, we grant you permission to do this, you can do this. So that's kind of how we've been looking at it from a systems approach. Thanks, Kate. Really appreciate all of the information and appreciate the good work that you all have done as a, as a, as a state department. Could you say more about the fact that it's the districts are under local control? Like, so the, while the state actually creates the conditions for this, I mean, and so how, how do districts actually implement or uh, move forward with the, with the strategy? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, really making, like, I think giving those concrete examples, and I think that um, I know Kathy, when we were kind of preparing for this, was saying that people really need to believe that they can do this. So seeing those concrete examples, that's one of the reasons that we wanted the illustrated guide, like we wanted pictures to demonstrate like what that would actually look like in practice, because I think it, um, 
you know, like it's, I, I feel like play has got, we've gotten so far away from play that people are having a hard time envisioning it again. And so seeing those like actual images and you realize like, oh, oh yeah, we can do that. So I think it's just like building, building people's belief system, really, that this is something that they can, in fact, do. And, and that and that we're, you know, while we set the state standards, the standards are the what, they're not the how. And so they have a lot of flexibility in how they implement those standards. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that additional, that additional context. And so we will... We'll, we'll kind of get to um, the end of this session with Kathy and Kathy, who is our freshly retired kindergarten teacher with direct experience implementing play-based learning into her daily curriculum or daily approach. And I understand you have a short video that will give us a real picture of what play-based learning looks like in the kindergarten classroom. So would you like to show that first or tell us a bit about what it takes to be successful and make real impacts on students' progress in a critical year, in the critical year of kindergarten so that they are prepared for first grade and elementary school? Thank you, Bill. I'm gonna wait on the video for a second. Uh, just let you know, yes, I just retired. I just climbed out of the kindergarten sandbox. I still have sand all over me, every nook and cranny. And I have a funny feeling it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. But what a great way for me. I'm hoping to share with you my fresh perspective and my passion for what I've seen, the change that a play-based program has made. Um, so I've taught 37 years, but 36 years in kindergarten. Uh, I found a job I love and never worked a day in my life. That's Mark Twain. But teaching is hard. We all know it's hard. It became easier and better um, thanks to my school district. So a big shout out to Westchester Area School District and former superintendent, uh, Dr. Jim Scanlon and Dr. Tammy Florio, who hooked up with Kathy hirsch Pasick, and they wrote kindergarten teachers a prescription to play. So... I, I was elated. I mean, we got a prescription to play when other districts are removing play sets uh, as if childhood became obsolete to make room for all these new scripted programs. So thank you so much to my school district is right. So in my 36 years in kindergarten, I've always incorporated play into something, but never until 10 years ago when we got that prescription from our district and fairy godmother Kathy hirsch Pasick waved her magic wand on me and I just fell in love. So even though I thought I was playing, you know, I did free play, I did some playful play-based activities. She made us see the purpose behind play and the power it has. So it, it's amazing. It, and especially even after the pandemic, um, I started my classroom out with playing, the power that play has, okay? So play-based program in my classroom, it's not a free for all. Kids are not running all over the place. Um, it's not a scripted program, uh, even though scripted programs are great. And I know many of you out there probably have heard of Hegarty. So when you don't have enough rhyming words, you have that Hegarty script to look at. Um, but it is a well thought out, planned, um, playful, joyful uh, learning experience, not just for the students, but for, for myself too. Uh, play in my classroom evens out the playing field. Every child comes and they can bring what they know. It is universal. Play is universal. Uh, even the UN has recognized play as a legal right in the Article 31. It's just amazing. Um, so in my classroom, I use play as a tool now to teach and even to assess Along with, yes, my scripted programs that we have, we can kind of uh, integrate them into everything. Um, I do literacy centers that are play-based. I have math centers that are play-based. Everything's all content taught through play. My most favorite time of my day is the end of the day when we used to teach science and social studies. Now, during that time, okay, I infuse um, our, our curriculum into play. I become not a teacher anymore. I become a facilitator. And the children are the teachers of their learning. They control their learning, they organize it, they create it. So it's content-based play, but there's purpose to it. 
So how do I do that? I set up a, a system at the beginning of the year, okay? And we have usually five centers, a dramatic play center, a block center, an art center, sometimes even a music center, um, a STEM center. And the kids then, we discuss what we were learning, what are the standards we're gonna learn, like in social studies was community helpers, science, five senses, healthy eating. So each month they get to plan their own play centers. So the video you're gonna see in a short bit uh, was in November and we had a morning meeting and that's also so important to help um, improve language acquisition too. We have a meeting and we talk about what kind of uh, things we wanna learn this month and I tell them the standards. So they start to think, okay, well, I was just in Wegmans and I saw all this food stacked up. So they know it's something about food. And we said, well, they are collecting food for a food bank. And somebody goes, well, my mom's planning dinner. My grandparents are coming over. So they just started in a discussion. It's all them. I am just a facilitator. And they say, well, can we do a supermarket, Mrs. Bear? So I say, sure. So during a whole week, that last 30 to 45 minutes of the day, the kids plan. And you think the planning, they'd be sad that they're not playing. That planning for them, they are playing. Okay, it is playful learning. They're learning, well, what are we gonna name the store? What do we need in a store? What roles are we going to play? They create roles. We need a cashier. We need people who are shopping. We need somebody to sort the veggies or the meats, okay? So that would be the dramatic play. They plan out what's gonna be in the art center. They said, well, let's do painting of fruit. And I even had the art teacher enter. So it's all cooperative, but I'm facilitating. They're planning it. They're learning. Then say for the block center, they said, well, can we bring our food in to donate to the food center? We can use that to build. And that way they were learning 3D and 2D shapes, which ones were best as they're building. So there's all these things uh, they learn through play. Now, my classroom in the past couple of years has become even more diverse than ever. This year I had 23 students, 16 of them qualified for learning support or not learning support, uh, reading support. I had autistic students. I had emotional support students. I had behavior students. And what I see every year when I get them, I go, the power that play has to create a community that knows how to collaborate, uh, think critically, um, uh, be creative with each other. Because I think that what we want through play, we're starting to see that through play, kids are gonna learn to become more confident, curious, okay? and become contributing citizens someday. And that's what we all want, okay? So I'm a big believer in play. I've seen it play out with all my students. So we can watch this video too, but I want to say to all the administrators out there, okay, you need to jump on board too. I remember years ago when I would just even do a free play of kitchen sets, principals would come in and say, oh, you're playing again, but they're playing, they're learning. And now through this purposeful play, it is magical and literally I'll talk more maybe later on about test scores and things in our district that have gone up, but it's amazing. So if we can watch that video and then I can share um, some of the examples of the standards maybe that we, we see through here. So this is uh, called the Bear Cupboard Supermarket. So see his role, he's encoding words to make his list. No pressure, no stress. Now that one student just arrived from France a few days ago, didn't know any English, but she knew how to play. She wanted to move her role. Nobody's coming for the cashier. Slow day, huh? Waiting a long line. Yeah. Yeah, they were learning 3D wow. shapes. So I them, the them. They knew the difference between yeah. a 3D and a 2D. Oh, there's some watercolor over here. Oh, that's cute. I traced it. Love the nice. communication they have with each other.
It makes me laugh and smile every time I see kids play. It's wonderful. Kathy, that was excellent. And just wanted to know if you had anything else you wanted to add in terms of like parents, for instance, what were what was their reaction to like the 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 activities that their young people were engaged, the children were engaged in in your class? Well, just like some administrators, it's hard to have them buy in. But sometimes when I showed the videos and I shared a lot of videos through a platform called Seesaw with parents and even wrote the standards so they understood. So even though I had students, I mean, literally of all, all abilities, I had kids who had never had any preschool, uh, never held a pencil, couldn't write their name, to kids that, yes, they can read, they could do things, but they didn't have a lot of executive functioning. They didn't know how to organize themselves because mom and dad always organized themselves. So it showed the parents how important it was and what their kids learned. They got to see uh, some of my parents, the auti their autistic child, have volleys with another student. They had a roll necklace on like firefighter one day. They were calling up 911, asking what's wrong. So they were having those volleys. So parents really did buy into it. I even had parents, if they wanted to, they were welcome to come in uh, and help out. I always asked if they have a donation. I think that's also so important that parents feel a part of it and they saw it. So even when uh, the kids finished play at home, parents would say, oh my goodness, they're playing with your younger brother and sister. They're doing the same play thing at home now too. So they're not on the iPad at home. They're actually playing and creating these roles. So I think the buy-in too was sharing videos, telling them right away how important play is at my first open house and then continuing them showing them the standards and how they're learning. So just, I think maybe I could even share a little bit about the standards that were in that video. Um, writing that list, they had to decide they're making roles. Uh, so the one person said, I'll be the daddy, a little roll necklace or something on. He was said, I'll make the grocery list this time. They, they have to decide who's making the grocery list. So he's encoding it. Somebody else is trying to read it. They have to be able to de decode it. So they're all working together. So that's building their letters and sounds. And in our district, our scores went up in letter sounds through our dibbles and Acadians, it's called Acadians now. So that showed a significant rise, I think, because of play. Uh, the cashier registered too. I said that they're learning about money. I took my kids during that week of planning up to our cafeteria and spoke to our cafeteria uh, staff and they were asking great questions. Uh, that's building that language too. Like, um, what happens if you run out of ice cream? Well, then, you know, do you get new ones? Or, you know, how much do you, why do you charge that much for this? So when the kids were bringing in their materials, their empty boxes to sell, they had to use their math skills and decide too, they asked for a scale, which is heavier. Well, this big box of cereal, okay, is bigger, so it should be more. They're using words like more and less. So, and they're writing numbers. So math skills in there, they're using money. I gave them a certain amount of money that they could use to buy. So they knew a budget. So they had to look at the price and try to add it up a bit. Uh, so it just kind of made them a, a, aware of life skills. This is a budget, you have to live on a budget. The block center you saw too, that they realized are holding those 3D shapes and knew that the cylinders were the better for the base. And I heard other kids other days talk about uh, why the boxes at the bottom and then the cylinders and things and cans at top didn't work very well. Uh, so they were learning about that. So when I asked the students later on uh, to describe 3D and 2D shapes and the differences, they were much more able to meet those standards. The art center too, they were sorting, you know, good vegetables, healthy for you and, and not so healthy food. So they just learned so much. But the biggest change in scores for our school district was in writing scores. Um, because writing is the spoken language written down. I mean, we can sit there with a script and talk, 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 talk. These kids are talking to one another. So when I asked them to write about their experience, whether it read about the supermarket or if we did our Snow Much Fun Igloo uh, scene, they were able to realize what winter was instead of not, you know, they experienced it. So they were using great words and language. So our writing went up. We also increased different domains of our writing. Um, conventions went up, 
and also um, style using describing words. So just something you could do. It, it is, it's, it's very, like I said, I, a lot of plan of it, but I thought I'd rather teach describing words through play. So I said, hmm, how am I gonna do that? So when they brought a box of something of their favorite food, it's real to them. So they brought Lucky Charms in. I said, we're gonna make a commercial. You have to describe your box of cereal so somebody else will wanna buy it. So they learn to use describing words and that's perfect. And then what happens is it goes back into writing. Now tell me about your cereal in writing and they were able to better put it down into words. So across the border, scores went up. My autistic kids, I had speech teachers coming down to my classroom, the learning support kids, teachers coming in. They observed during play. They saw the kids meet more of their goals than when they were being pulled out me with another student. Because I think play is powerful. Our job too is to build that comfort level. And when they become comfortable, they become confident and they become risk takers and competent in our future community. So, but play is powerful. You can do it. Teachers, you can do it. Uh, once you get going and you get a system down pat, it is unbelievable. From what I saw 36 years ago, my first couple of years of teaching till just this past June, the difference a purposeful play-based program makes is awesome. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing all of that information. And I want to I want to thank all of the panelists for all of the tremendous information that you have provided for us. Um, and for this session. And so thank you to all of you. And now here's an opportunity to get questions from the audience. And it's a reminder to everyone to post their questions in the Q&A box. I, I saw that many of the questions that were posted there have already been answered. But Kathy, there is one question for you that just came through from Alan, I believe. And then Alan was asking what time of year was the video, right? So, and he, I mean, he says it looked like kids were really and fully engaged. I mean, was this at what point in the year was was the video? That video was in November. Every month I kind of created a theme based on what we were learning, our content in science and social studies. So they build a theme, say, in September. It was more or less just that free play breaking into routine. October, they talk this year. It changes every year. The kids kind of create whatever they they want. Um so we did happy, healthy heart in February. So they said hospital. So, but that was in November. And so if you're looking at that in November, you should see them in the May and June play theme. What a difference in their growth too. I can only imagine. Thank you. Thank you for responding to the question and thanks Alan for the question. And I wanna remind everyone that in a few minutes, you're gonna have a poll and we're gonna ask that you fill that poll out so that, oh, I think it just came through, so that you can give us feedback on this and the we love feedback here and your feedback is extremely important. And so thank you for that. Uh, so do we have other questions? And I'm gonna ask for help uh, from Emily. I'm here <laughs> and I wanna say first, thank you to all of our awesome speakers for answering the questions and writing. And I thought, so just some of the themes that came through that you know they've all been answered, but um, the first one is really looking at how, um, so syst you know, making the change at the systems level, the connection to policy, like what is it really gonna take to, to make that change at the level that you all have said is needed. Um, and if you could speak about the connection to policy and, you know, I think, you know, we have Kate here from Minnesota, I Rory from Oklahoma said that that state is also legislated play-based learning, but we'd love to just hear your feedback on the connection to policy, but then also what does it really take to make that system level change? Well, I'll ask stuff since we've done it just for a sec. Oh, I'm sorry, Kate, if you were going to answer, go. I was just going to say that partly it's, you know, the burden was on us to first show that it worked. And then the next burden on us was to show that you could scout a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes policy is quirky. As Kate was saying, you're dealing with districts, then the districts have somebody on the 
board of the district and they have a certain thing that they really care about and their uncle is a legislator. I know it sounds crazy to say, but in many cases, that's kind of the way it happens. And in our case, the first state that did come through for play-based learning was the state of New Hampshire. And um, we had a past student who's an amazing, amazing researcher who um, who happened happened to be in New Hampshire and immediately uh, just jumped on her name is Dr. Kim Nesbitt. And so when she jumped on it, we all got a chance to see would it work across 29, you know, classrooms? What did it look like? And the first results were so darn promising. And, and as we've all acknowledged here, what we, what we have been doing isn't working. Right. Since 1975, we knew we had a nation at risk. Or was it 1981? We we're screaming about it. And we've had, what, four or five education presidents. Right. And the numbers never change or the so-called gap that we talk about never changes. So I guess to get to policy, it's why keep doing what isn't working when you have some evidence, um, scalable evidence and lab based evidence and stuff that's consistent with the way the human brain learns that is working. Why not at least give it a whirl? I was just going to add that, you know, we've really observed that there's not just one thing that needs to be done in order to promote the practice of play. Um, yes, there are, you know, policy things, there are proposals and, you know, that go to the legislature. One of the things that we've discussed is, you know, we, we hear frequently that sometimes principals and administrators are coming from a secondary background and they don't have as much understanding of developmentally appropriate practices for our youngest learners. So maybe looking at something related to, you know, their licensing or their um, pre-service education um, that could kind of more robustly address that um, for people who are in those administrative roles. That's one thing, but we also know that we can't overlook the importance of buy-in at the grassroots level. Honestly, I think some of the, I mean, look at how powerful Kathy's presentation was today. Um, having teachers that are doing it well and demonstrating the benefits of it, that it's, you know, it's like, it goes viral. It, and when other teachers see like, oh man, like I can do that and that's working really well. And so like, I think you really have to come at it, not just from like a top down approach, but like creating that buy in at the grassroots level is so incredibly important. So it's it's not just a one size fits all answer, um, you know, with just state policies, like you really have to get at all parts of the system. And um, Kate, I, so I'd like to think maybe this you know, GLR webinar with 300 plus people might help a little bit in that regard. <laughs> but also I wanted to, to build on that a little bit because we have a question from Michelle, a question from Crystal about that, the barriers, like how do we break through the barriers? What about the play-based learning in the home? What about like parent attitudes toward this, towards this, especially, you know, uh, in general, not knowing anything about it, but then also expecting their kid to be doing stuff that's more what Kathy described, you know, like drill and kill. Um, so that when you're talking about that grassroots level, like what are some of the ways to break down those barriers? And so we can start with you, Kate, and then others can chime in too, of course. Sure. One of the things that we're um, exploring. So in Minnesota, we have a program called Early Childhood Family Education, um, and it can go all the way up to third grade. But, you know, we have these family educators that are just incredible at connecting with parents and really getting family engagement and they're in a really important position to help educate families about the importance of play. And that play isn't just a frivolous thing. Like when they're in, you know, meaningfully engaging with their child in these playful and joyful ways, there's so many skills that are you know, being imparted to their child. And another audience that we know is incredibly important are our child care workers. Um, they're uh, licensed under a different agency. So we really have to partner with, um, you know, our colleagues across agencies in order to um, make sure that we're addressing that audience. But we do realize that this is more than just schools. This is families. This is communities, um, public libraries. I saw somebody put that in the chat. We've we've engaged with um, our public librarians because they play such an important role and, you know, have so many interactions with families and children. So yeah, we really have to, we, we have to look beyond just the system of the school. We have to look at like the ecosystem of the child. 
I want to bring in Abby on that one because I'm sure you're you're thinking a lot about PBS and the stuff that goes right into the home because of the TV. Yeah, it's true. The um, informal setting is really our our focus, and and also just that play is happening all the time. Um, just as part of kids' lives, I mentioned a couple examples of how we're designing explicitly some games for play. So, like uh, some of the games, like Andres mentioned, like when when parents recognize a type of game, they're in. Like, there's no explaining you have to do right if you're playing peekaboo, if you're playing a matching type game, or some call and response. Um, we have a game called vacuum hockey, but honestly, it's reminiscent of like a STEM version of, you know, ping pong kind of thing. So looking at play patterns that naturally invite someone into that is a, a great approach. Um, and also just thinking more holistically about the ecosystem. I mentioned getting the content out, getting out to partners, uh, educators um, through local PBS stations is um, and, and the libraries and all those contexts um, um, is important. Just inviting all those play, the invitation to play in all those contexts. I know both Ryan and um, Andres wanted to add to this. So Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I think when and anytime when we talk about our work with families, we have to <clears throat> start with a discussion around cultural humility. And I think that's really important. And so um, just one resource that I share often is Project Ready, R-E-A-D-Y. And they have a great framework for Ed, that can be used for educators and other practitioners to really start to explore our own beliefs, biases, values, and how that translates and supports the work that we're doing with families. Because I think we have conversations about what families are <clears throat> doing in the home, what we want to encourage them to be doing, and don't always center the fact that, you know, no one wants their child to succeed more than a parent and that exactly how parents are raising their kids it you know is culturally appropriate and we have to be responsive and appreciative of that and so i think um continuing to lift cultural humility as a journey for all of us to be on um is an important is important go ahead andreas one 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, just really quickly, I think it just ties back to our conversation earlier about the framing that we um, take when we think about um, children, but also families in, in communities of color um, and thinking about uh, uh, the way that we position them as experts and, 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 and with assets to offer and to bring. And so when you engage a family and tell them that, Hey, when you speak to your your child in another language at home, that's a huge asset and that's a huge benefit. Or those games that you play at home, they have learning value. Or when you cook with your kids, you're building valuable math skills uh, as along with bonding with them. And so, um, I just think that continuing with this asset based framework and really building from community strengths is um, something we have to keep circling back to. And I'll just give a shout out to one of my colleagues, Christy McWayne at Tufts University who has a really cool project about um, home to school connections. It's called RISE. So I encourage y'all to check it out. It's really about um, parent engagement and empowerment. So it's it's uh, a great resource. Well, I'm gonna just quit. I know we're at time right now. So Bill, I don't know if you were gonna say anything else but I'm gonna say huge thanks to all of you. Bill, your moderation and facilitation was pro of course. Thank you. I mean, such a such a gold medal panel. 